Welcome to the Global DIY webinar series, to all our members from all over the world and to all our friends and for all those people watching in to this webinar today. Today we'll be discussing the private label, why and how. Such a very important uh, issue to be discussed and this can be seen by the many people following this webinar today. Following it not only because of the subject, but I'm also delighted to that we are taking part is two industry icons. The first one is Jim English, who is well known from the, his days at the Home Depot, where he was the executive vice president for the strategic development and also for the merchandising. He is the author of the best-selling book, Breakthrough Retailing, which I can honestly say is the very best book I've ever read on retail management. So may I now introduce Jim English to join us, and he will be then introducing his partner. Well, thank you, John, and uh, good morning from Atlanta. Um, we are going to talk about uh, private label merchandising today, and we're seeing a growing interest in the retail market for private label products by consumers looking for value both due to inflation and recessionary concerns. The Private Brand Manufacturers Association in the US reported that private label sales were up 11.3% last year, while sales of the national brands increased a lesser 6%. Today, we will explore both the opportunities and the challenges of private label merchandising with Francisco Torres, Executive Vice President of Sodomac Home Centers. Sodomac operates home improvement stores in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, and Uruguay, making it clearly the leader in home improvement and construction markets in South America. So um, in addition, GAN recognizes Sodomac as the 10th largest volume home center chain in the world. So welcome Francisco Torres to this uh, virtual summit program. Hi Jim, good morning from the Americas and hello John, afternoon for Europe. It's a pleasure once again, talk about the home center business and share ideas with both of you. Yes, and, and I would like to get your thoughts this morning or this afternoon if you're in Europe on uh, private label merchandising. And, Perhaps we could start by asking you to give us an overview of your responsibilities at Sodomac and uh, explain how that's intertwined with Sodomac's private label programs. Yes, Jim, you know, it feels like yesterday when I first joined Sodomac almost 36, 36 years ago. It was October 1987. And I remember that at the end of that same month, I was invited to a huge celebration. The reason, Sodimac reached a record level of sales of 100 million Chilean pesos. That same amount of comparable money currently we sell in less than two hours. That has been the remarkable growth of Sodimac. In that process, I play, let's call it in uh, Hollywood terms, uh, an actor in a supporting role. So let's talk about that role. At, at the beginning, I was in charge of logistics for around seven years. Then I moved to technology, computer science, for another two years. Then, you know, believe it or not, I was promoted to finance. Yes, Jim, I also was the CFO of Sodima for two years. We won't hold that against you. <laughs> well, it, it, it teach me where not to be. <laughs> in, in 1996, my life changed dramatically. I was promoted to merchandise, the passion of, of my life. And lucky me, a year later, the number one home improvement retailer in the world start to open stores in Chile, a tiny country at the end of the world. So as you can imagine, that confrontation was epic, but it did not last that much because you know, in January 2001, they decided to leave South America. And because of that confrontation, uh, we, we have a, an emerging stronger Sodimac uh, that was looking into expansion through Latin America. So in 2006, when we already have operations in Argentina, Chile, Colombia, and Peru, the Sodima Corporation was created. 
And I was actually the second employee for that new corporation. Of course, you know him. The first one was our original CEO, Mr. Guillermo Aguero. So my role uh, as the head merchant of this uh, new organization was creating value for the countries. How? First through negotiation with global vendors, then the subject of, of this webinar, the development of powerful private brand, and of course, the detection of synergies and good practices between the countries. Those good, good practices, of course, have after to be spread through, through the, the other countries. So, Jim, I think this is a short, but precise trailer of what happened in Sodima for the past 36 years. Well, <clears throat> you certainly uh, have a clear vision for growing your business, number one, and, uh, and then of course, creating the right uh, private label products. Uh, can you give us an idea of how important private label products are to Sodomac and what you see as the current trend line in your, in your sales of these products? Well, let me tell you, private brands are very, very important for, for Sodima. And of course, the development of uh, these strong brands is a long journey. Some of our brands are more than 30 years old. Through that journey, we have currently reached a level where more than 30% of our sales and more than 40% of our margin dollars came from private brands. That's why I said before, yeah, they, they are very critical. Also, it is important to mention that Private brands play a critical role in increasing the leverage with your local vendors. If you consider that near 25% of sodium sales came from, from commodity products, you know, things like timber, cement, brick, steel, that are monopolies or oligopolies in most of the times, there is very little room there for private brands. So we feel our current status of penetration is significant. Just to give an idea, you know, only 10 years ago, those figures were 20% in uh, sales and 30% in margin dollars. That means we have experienced a compound average growth rate of almost 12 points, 12% 12 sorry, in the past 10 years. Uh, and this is uh, significant. You know, only during the pandemic period that it happens to everybody, it was very difficult to get the merchandise. We have delayed production time, then we have uh, all the ports, with from congestion, so only during that period, yeah, the, the penetration diminished a little bit because we, we were forced to buy more locally because we didn't have the, the imported merchandise on time. But after the pandemic this past year and a half, we saw the private brand uh, growing again at the regular rate. Well, you know, it's clear that you your private label products uh, have a a big impact on your sales, but even a bigger impact on your profitability. Yet, many companies tend to use private label almost exclusively as uh, opening price point products. What is Sodamax's approach to positioning your various private label uh, brands? Uh, we, we feel that concentrating OPP brands in, in the opening price point is, is not good, it's a mistake. Our approach differs from, from concentrating our sales there. Because in, in opening price point, what really matters to the customer is the price. They are buying the product because it's a good product at a reasonable price, not for the brand that the product has. So I would say somehow OPP brands are a contradiction. For us in Sodimac, the real art is to develop brands located in different segments of the price matrix. Always, of course, taking into consideration the market situation of the other brands and looking to find opportunities or niches where we can create our powerful brands. Uh, I would like to share with you that we currently have a portfolio of more than 25 brands. Everyone with a defined architecture, a price strategy, and usually a mirror brand. Francisco, what, what you want to explain what a mirror brand would be? Yeah, it's, it's very simple, Jim. Uh, for us, a, a mirror brand is the closest national brand to our private brand. So we use it as a price reference, then we define how how close we want to be uh, above or below that, that uh, established brand and also serve you as a assortment reference. So what are the new items they are developing or in which areas that brand has presence. So that's why we call a mirror brand because we are somehow following uh, what, what the others are, are doing. Uh, 
in our current portfolio, you know, some we have in do-it-yourself segments with, with let's say mid-range uh, prices. Others are devoted for professionals with high performance levels, but of course also higher prices. Other of our private brands are focused on the feminine segments of the customer base. You see, so we have different brands located in, in different price points devoted to different segments. So it's very fair to say that in Solimac there is no one brand like another. Every brand is aware by itself. So with 25 uh, private label brands that, you, that you're managing, how do you maintain that balance between those important house brands and the competing local and national brands? How do you, how do you keep that balance? Yeah, this is a, a, a very good question and it's not easy. We feel that there is uh, no rule or recipe and every category and every country is different. Uh, for that, we created a group of products in every private brand that is a must to have in all seven countries. We call those, <clears throat> sorry, the column items. But we also have another group in our assortment of imported merchandise called the menu. And those are optional, optional items for the, for the products. Just to give you an idea, currently 31% of the items representing 65% of the imported sales are column items. So our idea is to concentrate there as much as possible of our purchasing power, having in those items the core of our price competitiveness and allowing the menu products to play an important role for filling the local differences. Now, specifically talking about the balance between local and international brands and our private brands, we need to take always the customer view. They have brands in their mind and usually expect to find those brands in the Sodimax stores. So the lack of presence of those key brands tend to weaken the Sodimax dominance perception in customers' mind. And therefore, instead of being something good for you, place against you. The more a category is professionally oriented, the more there is a need of established brands. The more do-it-yourself a category is, then your private brand share can be higher. Based on my experience for professional categories, if you, let's say, pass the level of 30, 35 percent uh, in private brand share of the sales, you start losing customers due to a weaker dominance. But this is just a rule of thumb number. As I said at the beginning, there is no rule. Every situation, Jim, is different. So can we assume that most of your private label products are not sourced domestically, but rather sourced from foreign countries? And if so, how do you manage the sourcing, logistics, quality control uh, challenges that that brings about? Yes, you are right. Most, most of our private brands are imported, but I think you will be surprised by the percentage of, of uh, merchandise that is Locally sourced. In our case, it's 70% imported, 30% locally sourced. Uh, we have we have a private brand in areas like paint and tiles, and those categories tend to be sourced locally. That generates the 30% I mentioned before. But let, let's talk about the organization required to develop private brands. For, for the sourcing part, we decided to be closer to the factories. So in 2004, we opened our sourcing office in Shanghai. Those people are in the right time zone, speak the right language and have a common culture. So for them, it's much easier to work with Chinese vendors, visit all relevant firms in the Orient and provide us with a constant flow of innovation for our private brands. To be able to generate strong brands, you also need to develop a human instructor, including engineers, you know, like metal, chemical, textile. You need to have quality control specialists. You need to have designers, and also you need to have packaging specialists. And critical is that you need to understand your customer needs and develop the right products for them. Those items should be better and should have more value than the ones created by your common vendors. You are closer in the knowledge of your customer, use that. Building a world-class brand is far more from buying stuff from a factory shelves and changing you know, just the colors and the packaging. Powerful brands start with design, specs, and those aspects are highly technical. 
Also, it's important to mention that having the right specs for all items allow you to change those programs from one factory to another in the search for better service or high profitability and allows you to have the right quality control prior to the delivery of the goods. Let's talk about quality. The vendors and the products are assigned to a specific risk level. Vendors of products with low risk will tend to have only random quality checks. On the other extreme of the spectrum, risky vendors or items, for example, you know, the, the one using gas or electricity, we will have a quality control inspection on them on every single order. These inspections are performed by external companies that are recognized as worldwide leaders. Some are experts in tools or engines, uh, others in products related with electricity, others in textile, etc. So we use a different inspection company depending on the product category. Another challenge is the minimum order quantity, the master carton and the inner part. Those needs to be right for the level of sales that you uh, are uh, getting in the Sodimax stores. For low movers, for example, we probably will use single unit packet full spectrum. For mid-range movers, we could very well specify a cut case or multiple cut cases. And for fast mover, it's not as strange that the package will be a pallet. We used to have most of our sourcing concentrated in China, but now with the experience of COVID, we are in the process of diversification uh, of our sourcing matrix, moving as part of the business away from China whenever that is possible. So with so many of your products coming from, still coming from China and, and similar far-flung regions, what ESG issues are you focused on? And more important, what steps are you taking to assure sustainability within your private label products? Well, this is a, a very important question. I, I need to be honest and tell you that in the past, uh, we have a priority in aspects like changing packaging material, for example, moving out from PVC and defining the right sizing of the packaging. So we were making progress, let's say, in the exterior, in the envelope of the product. Now we are extending our focus in the sustainability to the product itself. Just to give you an idea, currently 7% of our uh, seven country sales uh, came from sustainable products. And our goal is to reach the 30% level by the year 2025. And this is, believe me, very challenging. Of course, due to the size and influence of Sodimac in most of the countries, developing more sustainable products for our private brands will create a, a similar movement in the local vendors. So then we will have Sodimac pointing in one direction and the local vendors pointing in the same direction. And that direction will be the improvement of the assortment in order to have a more sustainability in our offer. So you've clearly outlined how Sodamax focus uh, is on quality uh, private label products. So how do you promote these higher level, higher end private label products in order to develop both brand awareness and brand preference with uh, customers? Well, as, as you know, Jim, this is not an easy task. To position a brand in customer minds takes time and of course takes money. So uh, as we said, we concentrate our marketing effort in a selection of only six of our strategic brands. For every new brand, the problem is that you need to make a big investment at the beginning, but the sales are not enough to support that investment. So the exercise we make is to agree where we want the brand to be positioned in the next five years. Mm -hmm. Then we build a marketing plan to reach that goal and define a percentage of the sales of the brand that will be allocated to finance that plan. As you can imagine, in early stages, the money needed is much more than what you get from the brand. So Sodima Corporate helps with the difference. But on the final stages, it, it happens just the opposite, and Sodima recovers what they provide before. Control is always necessary, so we follow through with periodic studies regarding the progress of positioning of each of these brands and do the necessary changes in order to reach the agreed goal. So you establish a five-year plan to educate and motivate the customers. So how do you then bring this knowledge and this enthusiasm to your own salespeople? What is the role of the Sodamac sales associate 
in selling the private lands and brands and how do you how do you motivate uh, your salespeople to be excited about your brands? Yeah, this is absolutely critical. The, the role of, of the sales force is a key in the success of the private brand. They need to believe in your brand. They need to have the necessary knowledge to answer the customer's question properly. Imagine they just said, oh, this brand is from China or, or even worse, do not buy this brand or I don't know this brand. Then all the efforts we talked about before in search, in design, quality controls, all those efforts has zero value because the customer will run away from your brand. So in order to have an informed and knowledgeable sales force, you need to constantly train and inform them about the new developments, the analysis of performance of your brands against other brands in the market. And a good option we tend to use very often is to provide them with periodic training clinics. So it's, it's, it's obvious that you're very excited about private brands and private labels. And we see the importance to the sales and the profitability, but the question is, can you have too many private brands? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And as a matter of fact, Sodima used to have too many. Uh, so we can say the risk of a problem private brand mania, let's call it that way, is not only possible, it's probably certain. Uh, for example, when we beginning the, the, the development of private brand, it was like 40 years ago. Until 2010, we developed more than 45 brands, more than 45 brands. It was a lot, it was too far, too difficult to handle, too difficult to position it. So we were a little bit in trouble and uh, we, uh, call for the help of a Canadian consulting uh, firm specialized in private brand called, called Watts, uh, and they help us merge many of those brands, creating a new brand architecture for all of the remaining ones. Uh, just to, to explain to you, a brand architecture is a definition of the scope of each brand in terms of categories to be covered. So, with the help of of this consultant, we finalized the process with 20 brands. So we moved from more than 45 to only 20 brands. Okay. So you can dimension the merging process there, where more than half of the, of the brands do not die, but merge into another generating this new architecture. And since that year, because this is a, a, a evolution process, it never stops. So since uh, when we made the 2010, we made this process, a new, you know, group of merchandise uh, of brands has been added through through the year. So we added a new brand in the pet segment, for example, very important pet segment in, in these days. Also a new uh, professional power tool brand, a smart home brand. And from the Falabella holding, we received some brands in the small appliances and appliances segment. So currently we have 26, 26 brands, still manageable. Uh, the process of analyzing your brand portfolio and finding areas of optimization is permanent. For example, we are just now in the process of replacing our do-it-yourself private branding hand tools with the name of Redline. And that, by the way, sold 60, 64 million dollars in sales last year by one of our powerful six brand, Bauker, the one used uh, in do yourself power tools. Bauker sold almost a hundred million dollars last year. So our expectation is that under this more powerful umbrella of, of Bauker, then the red line merchandise under this new name will probably sell around $70 million instead of the 64 it used to sell before. And as a result, we will also have a much powerful voucher brand and because now it will sell around $170 million instead of only a hand. Well, I like, I like the Bacher name. It, it sounds like a good German brand to me, you know? It is. It is German. <laughs> it is. <laughs> do you, in, do you in Latin America, sorry, in Latin America, somehow, <laughs> German, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, relate, related very closely to quality and to durability. So in, in things like tools, the other one, the professional brand I mentioned before is called Uberman. 
you know, yeah. also. Sounds a, a little German, name. doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but somehow German put Latin names for everything related with decoration. So <laughs> it is. That's true. Well, along those lines, do you ever use the Sodamac name, the actual name of your of your company, uh, on your private label products? Yeah, very few times. I will explain to you. Uh, the, your mother brand in this in this case is uh, Sodamac. Is so precious that we rarely use it in the products. You you find exceptions to that rule in you know things like a five gallon empty paint can, big garbage bag. Uh, and uh, of course they were closest because that's an, an expensive way to promote our mother brand Sodima. But to have your mother brand uh, as a retail brand for regular product is risky. In, in one hand, because you are exposing Sodima to the perception of those products. And it also reduces the flexibility of positioning your brand in different levels of the price matrix. Uh, Let's say we take Sodimac and then we apply Sodimac to the best paint. So it's an expensive paint named Sodimac. But at the same time, we took the same Sodimac name and put it in a, just a do-yourself level of power tools. Then that's a contradiction. How could it be the best in one area and something re uh, regular or average in another? You see, so you lose a lot of price flexibility when using, when using your mother brand, but also it's risky because any problem uh, uh, happening with the product with the name of sodium and then will affect your precious mother brand. The, the only multi-category brand we currently have uh, is an OPP brand uh, called Carson. So we will never put that the, the name of sodium. Yeah, well, there's clearly an opportunity, but also a danger uh, if you don't identify the right brand name and make sure that you've got the right um, description and the right marketing program for that niche. Um, looking into the future, what is your vision regarding the private label program at Sodamac and what new initiatives are you pursuing? Yeah, well, Jim, currently, and, and I mentioned this, this before, the most important development in private brand is the creation of products that are sustainable. The interior, the product itself should be sustainable mostly in recycled materials, energy and water saving, and using sustainable sources. We also are defining dates where Sodimac will no longer sell certain type of items that do not support the environment as they should. For example, the elimination of incandescent and halogen light bulbs, certain chemicals that harm the life environment. But of course, uh, we are providing timing, you know, to the vendors to give the opportunity for them to adapt to this, to this challenge. So it's not something will happen tomorrow. That's why we provide a, a, a date in the future. Then our second priority uh, is the integration of more brands to our smart home ecosystem. Uh, we, we call it awesome. Uh, and to give an idea that that ecosystem has grown more than 450% in the past uh, three years. So we are very excited about the performance and the acceptation of, of smart home. And when I say integrate brand is because what we provide is, is the, the software, but the brands, we have brands like Philips, we have brands like Yale. So it's other brands that integrate into even, even uh, you know, Alexa and uh, Google Home are integrated to this smart home system. That's Part of the reason for this remarkable growth. And finally, very important, uh, you need to remember that around 50% of our overall sales came from the professionals. So we are concentrating the development of more categories under our current programs that are topics and Uber. Those are the three main focus for, for uh, uh, moving forward with private brand chief. So Francisco, I, I think we have time maybe for just one more question. And so let me ask you, have you found that Sodamac's proven expertise in private label marketing has given you an advantage in negotiating better terms with established national and international brands? Yeah, I was, I was hoping for this question, Jim, and it's a, it's a very good point. You know that <clears throat> vendors usually are very concerned on, the, on their market share and a private brand 
but you need not to be a genius to understand that it represents a menace to that share. So they clearly understand that your new brand will provide extra margin dollars to you. So their initial reaction is to improve their commercial conditions, resulting for you in a better business. But this is uh, something uh, additional. Also, they know that if their fill rate to your orders is regular, that means you will end up selling more of your private brands than their brands. And as a consequence, that will reduce their market share. So the second positive reaction from local vendors is that now they improve the fill rate of your orders. So we have now a local vendor with better conditions and better service, and you have a powerful new brand with at least better conditions, that of course in conjunction generates a much better uh, impact in your sales and in your margin dollars. It's a good, good uh, scenario to have these private brands in certain categories. So you get the, the best of both worlds. Exactly, exactly. So, well, thank you Francisco Torres for this uh, enlightening insight into the merchandising of private label products. It's clear that Sodamac operates its private label program at a truly world-class level. You've shown that success requires investments in people, technical expertise, customer research, and branding promotion. Certainly, uh, discipline is obviously required to be able to source consistently high-quality products on a worldwide basis. It's encouraging to see that sustainability is also a high priority as you develop your private label program. So listen, best wishes for continued success. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, hope you continue to grow mm -hmm. that Sodamac brand uh, throughout uh, Latin America. Yes, we are in that process. <laughs> well, let's, re let's return to, again, headquarters to see uh, if we have time for some questions. Yes, Jim, I think we've got time for questions. So first of all, uh, thank you for putting these very, very important questions. From my point of view, it was one of the best webinars learning that I've, I've, I've seen so far. Um, thanks to your questioning and thank you to Francisco Torres for being so emotional and so passionate and uh, amazing to see that 30% of all your sales are private brand and 40% uh, of the profit. That is absolutely amazing. Um, and I've got so many questions, we can't answer them all, but I will pick out the, the ones that I, I've got in front of me here. The first of all, from a gentleman called Eric. Do Sodimac offer specific private labels marketed to specific customer groups, for example, young generations or those who, more sustain, who are more sustainability minded? Yes, the answer is, is yes. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. Every brand should be promoted uh, to the specific segment. You know, the, the old times where you put a and add on TV and uh, try to reach, uh, try to reach your customer. It ha has long over. So, for every brand, you need to do the communication to the proper customer base. Otherwise, you are losing your money. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the, today's communication tend tend to be more in a one to one or at least one to a cluster. Uh, example, for example, we have we have um. Uh, something called the deco lovers. Deco lovers is a is a mostly feminine segment of uh, ladies different ages that love to have a beautiful home, a nice decoration inside. So we we pick uh, items in different brands like the brand of paint, the brand of housewares, the brand of, of decoration, and make a specific offer for them. Uh, and the age plays a role on what we offer. So if it's a young feminine uh, uh, customer, we, we offer certain, that's a cluster and we offer set, certain assortment. If it's a more mature uh, lady, then we, that she belongs to another uh, cluster and then that other cluster is stimulated with not necessarily the same, the same assortment. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you, Francisco. I'd just like to say to Eric, uh, uh, to Eric, that it's not just the younger generations who think 
uh, yeah. or sustainability minded. I know Jim and you, you and I don't belong to that group, but we we are very much sustainability minded. Um, okay, we've now got a, a question from Michael. With nearshoring on the rise, many factories are re re relocating to countries outside China. Is this the case for Sodimax suppliers for its private labels? And if so, where do you see the products coming from if they don't come from China? Yeah, we, we have seen a, a big uh, migration of factories from China mostly to Vietnam and some of them to Taiwan. Uh, but these this, uh, migrations are well done. So it didn't generate interruption of, of the flows of, uh, of merchandise. And uh, in, in these other two markets, Taiwan and Vietnam, we do have also other vendors. So we have all the logistic infrastructure in place to move the merchandise away from those countries. So it would be just like, let's say a higher volume moving from those countries instead of having to develop, develop something from, from scratch. Mm -hmm. some, some, you know, are also moving uh, their factories to Mexico. That's another uh, very convenient for us because Mexico is um, it's very near in terms of uh, sea time. So. That, that's another uh, area of the world that is getting uh, factories from China. Yeah, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal just this morning about how many uh, Chinese companies are relocating in uh, Mexico and uh, how much the Mexican government is, uh, is encouraging it and uh, sponsoring it and celebrating it. Yeah. Uh, and I, I was recently visiting a, a trade fair where they had a, an Asian or a Chinese uh, uh, room, especially for the Chinese. And I must say, there was very, very few people. So I think there is there seems to be a general trend uh, not to put all your eggs in, in one basket, you know, as I say, in UK. Exactly. Yeah, because um, it was very painful for everybody during COVID days. Everybody mm -hmm. pays a big price uh, because of that excess of concentration in the, in the Asian, uh, especially in the Chinese factory. So. You know, you know, I, I might add, you know, I might add to that that you know the fact that um, Sodamac develops the specs uh, is real a key element in allowing you to move that product to other countries because uh, you are able to um, make sure that you maintain the same qualities, same specification, even the same packaging, and could yeah. even produce in multiple multiple countries uh, depending on the volume you need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the specs is a, is a very complete, very technical definition or description of everything in the product, everything. So it's like a recipe that you need to follow to generate that same product in a different location. So uh, it's what you said, it's a, a way to move from one factory to another in a painless way. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got now a question from Simon, which I like very much because... Um, uh, it's got your penetration of private label sales is very impressive. What steps are you taking to increase this percentage? But before you answer, my wife will now not go to a certain food retailer because they're trying to put too many on labels and she can't get the brand. So I see a danger in there. Uh, and I, I, I think you've also, so very interested to hear your answer on this, Francisco. Yes, I, I actually uh, make a suggestion on the on the presentation. I, I learned this lesson the hard way because when uh, we first developed the red line uh, brand, the one I explained that is now being moved to, to Bauker, that, rail, uh, that brand used to have 70% uh, margin, 70% margin. So uh, it was a huge business. And the established brands, people like uh, Black & Decker or Stanley, we were on those days, let's say on the level of 30%. So what we made was reducing, you know, dramatically the assortment of those established brands and putting red line everywhere. And as I said, the, the result was terrible because we have 70% margin, but in, in, in very few sales, mm -hmm. we lost the customers. The customer yeah. wanted to have those brands in our stores. So then we start, you know, uh, experimenting. And that is where my, my uh, rule of thumb of 30, 35% came. 
if you have around that presence of uh, items for local vendors, I mean, from, from private brands, you are okay. If you go further to that, because you are greedy and you want more money on, that you get that from the private brand, my experience is you start losing instead of gaining mm -hmm. because you lose the customer because the customer really wants to find those brands in your store and you have the duty to provide them those brands to, to that customer. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a very relevant question, I think. Should private label products be sold to other retailers? <laughs> yeah, we, we do it. <laughs> yeah, really? Of course, yes, of yeah. course. Yeah, we, we do it. We do it, of course, where where there is no geographical, uh, you know, uh, uh, over uh, over position. Yeah. Uh, actually, John, we used to do it uh, many many years ago. When before we entered the Brazilian market, probably twenty years ago, we do it with C and C. We sold all of our uh, patio furniture and all of our Christmas assortment to C and C. They sell it perfectly. Of course, we had to do the translation to, to Portuguese, but it was an excellent business for them, good business for us. We then, through their purchases, have more purchasing power with the factories. And we are currently evaluating the introduction of our private brands, let's say in other countries of Central America, for example, where we don't have an operation. Um, it's, a good, it's a good alternative for both, for the retailer mm -hmm. and also for the, for the new retailer that wanted to that, uh, that assortment. Well, we're, we're learning a lot this morning anyway. That, that's very interesting <laughs> to know that, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Here's another one from Holly. With such a long history of private labels, have you noticed trends in sales influenced by economic changes? For example, the large inflation currently seen in Europe. Has this affected your own label purchasing? Uh, it... <laughs> Probably it is, but not at the level that we are noticing. It. The, the trends we are noticing are more related with the assortment trends we are doing in, in Solimar. For, so, for example, uh, Solimar used to be a really, a, uh, I would say very honestly, a lousy seller of tiles. Lousy seller of tiles. Now we know. Uh, so when we introduce our operation in a strong a, a tiles market like Brazil, for example, we learn a lot as a consequence of that. We develop better and bigger assortment on, on uh, the flooring uh, department. And as a consequence of that, we have experienced a growing of the private brand in tiles that is far away from the growing of the other private brands. So, so the, the growth is more related with our trends and our actions than it is by the market. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we have another question here about the, the purchases. You said of purchase of all your own label, 70% are imported and 30% now are local. Um, how do you see that in, in going forward in the future? Yeah, I, I don't see it changing that much because Really, the 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 important uh, part, uh, I mean, the lo the local part came from from products that are expensive to transport, and it will remain to be expensive to transport. So, so probably things like uh, paint, tiles, some uh, building material items, uh, will probably have to be to be uh, locally sourced. Or I would say forever. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the, 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 situ, the factory situation in Latin America differs a lot from the one in Europe or in the US, where you have almost factories of everything. So mm -hmm. even if we want our uh, Bowker brand in Power Tools to be produced locally in some of the countries in Latin America, the answer is there is no production of those items there. So mm -hmm. until those factories decide to establish uh, a factory production in some of the Latin American countries, it will be impossible for us to buy uh, power tools from other sizes than, mm -hmm. you know, maybe Europe that is very expensive or China that is more mm -hmm. accessible. Mm -hmm. Okay. I did like your comments, by the way, on the German 
reputation of, of high quality products and uh, um, that, you, that you talked about. <laughs> so we've got one question here from Rancola. So quite a complicated question. One of the biggest challenges I continuously run into are the big box brand standards on their private label packaging. I often find this to be an obstacle to both the merchant and the supplier being able to tell stories on the packaging about what makes product innovative or better because these stories or bullet points are not within the brand standards. Yeah, we, we don't have, uh, I, I don't know um, which which retailer he's referring to, but we don't have yeah. those type of, of, of construction or, or limitations to the to the packaging of, of the private brands. Uh -huh. Okay. No. Don't. Yeah, I think those were really the the main questions that we've been asked to to ask you, uh, Francisco. Francisco, and <laughs> yeah, first of all, thank you very much indeed for this very very passionate thing, and and also Jim uh, for, for for these questions which have been very very important, and uh, we look forward to seeing you both, of course, at the Global DIY Summit, which in uh, 14th in to the 16th in Berlin. Are you coming? Sure. Yes, we'll be there. We are going yeah. to be there. <laughs> yeah, I'm very delighted. And so is over, over a thousand people more, I'm pleased to say. So again, thank you for this very, very important uh, and very uh, detailed discussion you give us about your own labor brands and the opportunities uh, for them. So thank you, Jim. We'll see you very shortly in Atlanta. And uh, Francisco, I look forward to seeing you very shortly in Berlin. And to all those people hey. watching us today, we hope we will also be able to meet you in the Global DIY Summit from the 14th to the 16th of June, where we have a top program, over a thousand people, over 300 retailers, is going to be another mega event. Let's get away from Zoom and uh, all the other things and let's yes. meet physically again. This is what we yes. all want. So from, from the, I think you said it, Jim, from the World Headquarters in Cologne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to you nice in Atlanta. You in, nice to see you in Germany again. John, yeah, it, very rarely there. Yeah, well, I've been around and about. <laughs> and all, and I, yeah, I was in I was in Madrid yesterday, but I'm back in here today. And Francisco, I look, very much look forward to seeing you again. And uh, thank you for this valuable contribution to our uh, global DIY webinar series. Thank you very much indeed. A, a pleasure, and John. And thank you, Jim, for these good good questions. Thank you, Francisco. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. And thank you to all our viewers. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.